morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, Lord's Day service as we rejoice in the fact that Jesus has died and he has risen. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this week, uh, well, there aren't that many of them because we're still in uh, the Easter holidays. We have a church prayer meeting on uh, Thursday night. Um, send exact details as, as to where that will be uh, out in the email um, later on in the week, but it will be half seven on Thursday night as usual. Um, sadly, there were no life groups for the children joining the service. Children are very welcome to stay in the service, or the ones that are very welcome to go out to uh, a crash uh, area as well, and do stay behind afterwards for uh, tea and coffee and refreshments. And we'll be uh, evening service here at half past six tonight as well, continuing to uh, focus on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we gather together this morning, very aware that we are a church uh, who are grieving. Uh, many of us will, uh, many of you will already know that Pam Harrison went to be with the Lord uh, yesterday morning. Uh, so we uh, continue to obviously pray uh, for Anthony and for the whole family. But as we grieve, we remember, don't we? We remember the gospel. We remember the good news that we are here to rejoice in and the risen Lord Jesus Christ uh, who uh, rules and reigns and those who die the Lord are safe with him. So with the Apostle Paul right at the start, I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel that was preached to you, which we received, in which we stand and by which we are being saved. If we hold fast to the word we preached, unless we believed in vain. Paul goes on to write, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to have Cephas then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of all, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, Paul writes, as to one untimely Paul, he appeared also to me. Paul writes, for I am least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it is not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Well, let's stand and sing, uh, and praise the Lord, see what a morning.
our Lord God and Heavenly Father, we pray to you on this Lord's Day, as we do on every uh, Lord's Day, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ has died, that he has died for our sins in accordance with uh, the Scripture. We thank you uh, that uh, all the promises that you made are yes in the Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. We thank you that death is defeated, that Satan, uh, Satan has been defeated, that sin has been dealt with. Thank you that he appeared, that these things were not done in a corner, that there are witnesses, that we can hear, hear their testimony, and we can stake our uh, life on uh, the words that they speak, uh, inspired by you. We praise you that the Lord Jesus is now uh, seated on high, risen, ruling. We th and thank you that he is returning. We thank you that all who uh, know and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, all his people are safe uh, and uh, we belong to you uh, and uh, we will be uh, raised again to life rather than judgment uh, rather than when he returns. I think this morning uh, as we uh, gather together that you may hear our praises as they come from hearts uh, which are, are full of joy and delight in you. Although if we come this morning uh, cold, if we come struggling, if we come uh, sad, if we come actually with hearts that are turned away from you, we pray that through your word you may comfort us, you may assure us, you might, may draw us to uh, repentance, uh, you may grow our faith and our trust in you. Pray that you'll speak as your word is opened, and that we may hear those words as they truly are the voice of the living God. And we pray that your spirit may be at work uh, amongst us, and that we may delight in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you may equip us to love and serve him this new week. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, I uh, I was thinking, um, thinking about today. It's a special day, isn't it? It is. Uh, well, traditionally we call it Easter Sunday. We celebrate. We remember uh, the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as, as Christians, as the church, that's what we remember uh, every day and every Sunday. We don't need a special Sunday for that. But I was thinking about the significance of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has died uh, and he's risen again. And um, got me thinking, rather strangely, about cats. Who likes cats? Who's got, who owns cats? I'm not saying who likes cats, that's a very divisive question, isn't it? Uh, who owns a cat? Anyone here owns a cat? That's good, that's good. We don't, we don't own a hat, cat in our household, but we've got the kind of next best thing, which I borrowed from one of my, uh, one of my children. So, um, the, the, a cat. Now, cats are, are quite amazing, aren't they, when you see them. Perhaps you see them running around, don't you, and you see them in their garden. They're very good, aren't they, at jumping up and jumping over things and squeezing through tight holes. Does anyone know how... Cats are able to squeeze through tight holes without getting stuck. It's all to do with their head. It's all to do with their head. So if the cats know that if they can get their head through something, everything else, everything that's attached to their head is going to be able, is going to follow. So if a cat can get a, get their head through a tiny little hole, then everything attached to their head is going to, uh, going to come through. And cats normally have this cat. It's a strange cat. It doesn't have any whiskers. But normally cats have got whiskers, haven't they? So they can tell, they can get their whiskers through. The whole body is going to come through. And in a funny way, it's, a, it's only an illustration, but it made me think uh, about uh, something that is said uh, in the Bible about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 14 that since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So we remember, don't we, the fact uh, that Jesus died, he went through death, and he rose again the other side. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, was raised uh, on, uh, uh, on that, that Sunday, wasn't he? He came through death, 
our Anthony. He's ascended to heaven now and he will come again. But the wonderful truth is, if, the, if it's true that the Lord Jesus Christ died and came through death, then everyone who is attached to Jesus will also come through death and be raised to, to new life with him. Another way that the Bible describes Jesus uh, is that he is the head. He's the head of his body. He's the head of his church. So it's a bit like a, 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 a kind of only an illustration, but, but if a cat's head can, can fit through that, fit, fit through a kind of difficult hole, the rest of the body, well, it has no choice. It will just come through it. And so if Jesus, if he has come through death, and we know he's come through death because we're celebrating that today, as we celebrate that every other, every Sunday, we know that if we belong to Jesus, then we will come, we will come through death as well. So, I'll read out that verse again from 1 Thessalonians 4, and we'll see something more of that as we look at the end of Mark's Gospel later on. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. If we're attached to Jesus, well, it's going to happen. Who can say it's no choice? But, you know, we, it's, we just look at what Jesus has done and what God has done through Jesus. If we belong to him, we will be brought through. So in that, we're going to sit down and we're going to rejoice in Jesus. Uh, for what he's done. Uh, kind of simple song, but the words are very precious, aren't they? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Jesus Christ, the 
crucifixion. We ended it um, with the centurion seeing how Jesus died, crying out, surely this man was the son of God. He saw the, the women uh, walk, watching, looking on from a distance. Uh, and then we're told in verse 42. When evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. When he learned from the centurion he was dead, he commanded the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. He rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early on, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone uh, for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. He said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. Let's pray together. Oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, we rejoice once again in just the victory of uh, that scene. We thank you that as we read those words, we are reading in a, a, a historical account the empty tomb, the risen Lord, the glorious hope of forgiveness and the defeat of death. We thank you that what happened uh, that weekend had, had cosmic uh, and eternal significance. We thank you that it means that Jesus Christ is Lord and Saviour and Judge. And as we look out uh, at a world which is so full of sin, where there are wars and atrocities, we thank you that uh, that the empty tomb and our risen Saviour and Lord means uh, that uh, death and sin and wickedness does not have the last word. We pray uh, that we may live in this world with the confidence that comes from knowing that there is a judgment, confidence that comes from knowing that wrongs will be righted. Father, we do pray this morning, come, Lord Jesus. We pray for those who are and sent on the front line of that kind of wickedness, Lord, we, we pray for those uh, facing uh, and in the midst of war in Ukraine and in other parts of the world. Father, we pray particularly for your, your people in those places, that they may just hold on to the gospel that they have believed and through which they have been saved. We pray that in the midst of those, those circumstances, you will be drawing people to the Lord Jesus Christ as the only hope. Well, we're not close to time this morning. We do pray particularly for Anthony and for Rachel and for Robert and for Richard and for Chris and for uh, the rest of uh, the Harrison family, Lord. And we do grieve uh, Pam's passing, but we, we thank you so much for her. We thank you that she belongs to you. We thank you for her godliness and for her faithfulness. We thank you for uh, just for, for them as a family. And Father, we pray particularly this morning uh, that the whole family may know uh, your love and your care for them, that 
the truth that they, they believe and have just spent their life passing on to others may be very real to them uh, and that they may know what it means to grieve with hope. Pray for us as a church as well as, as we grieve and that we, 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 may, we may know that uh, as well. Well, we pray for this coming week. You, you know what we need. You know what uh, this, we're going to face uh, over this coming week. But Father, we pray most of all that your kingdom will come and that your will will be done. We pray that you will provide for us our every need. Father, the daily bread that we need to survive, we recognise it comes from your hand. So we pray, thank you, thank you for it. We pray that you will continue to provide. We pray that you will keep us from evil and keep us from temptation and keep us running back to you in as we ask for forgiveness, knowing that there is forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we pray for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we come to God's word, again, let's stand and sing, I know that my Redeemer lives. But I think as we, we see the kind of point 
uh, of, uh, these, the, uh, of these verses, particularly in the light of the whole of Mark's Gospel, actually, it's a very powerful ending. Because although Jesus is, in a sense, absent from the verses, he is very much present. And that is very relevant to us this morning. Jesus is alive. Jesus is with us. We may not see him physically, but that does not mean that is not true. And so we are in the same situation as Mary at the end of verse 8 of Mark chapter 16. And so the question for all of us is, are we going to believe the account? Are we going to believe what God says to us in these words? And I've got two very, two very simple points, two very simple points that, that, that uh, I think uh, these, uh, this account of Jesus' burial and uh, the empty tomb is here to say to us this morning, uh, that they're, they're, they're very simple, fairly straightforward, but the two most fundamental points that we all need to get clear in our head, and actually if we get these clear in our head and if we live by them, well then they transform. They transform not just our life, but actually they transform our eternity as well. And these two points are this. Jesus is the Christ who has defeated death, and Jesus is the Christ who forgives our sins. Get those things clear in our head, and then we've got clear the point that Mark is making in the whole of his gospel. We've got clear, actually, all that we need to live by. Jesus is the Christ who's defeated death. He is the Christ who has forgiven our sins. So let's take them in turn. Jesus is the Christ who has defeated death. Now, death is... Well, it's the ultimate human problem. We don't, we don't like thinking about it. And we don't like talking about it. It's very much a kind of modern issue. If we lived 100 plus years ago, death would be, it would just surround us. If, if we went to church every Lord's Day, we would, most churches, there's a reason why churches are built, uh, older churches, in the middle of a graveyard. It's a reminder that death is ever present. And it's a reminder that the gospel, for all the good, and it does so much good in the present life, is actually about, well, the defeat of death. Now, from time to time, people kind of wake up to the reality of death. And I was very struck this week by reading an article by Jeremy Clarkson. You know, he of Top Gear fame and other things. He wrote an article in a newspaper just reflecting on where he'd come to in his life. He, he's just entered his 60s, I think he's 62, and he just wrote an article basically railing against the reality of old age and death. And he says this, in a few years' time, after I succumb to a terrible disease, no one is going to say that I fought to the bitter end bravely or stoically or with much in the way of dignity. Because I fear I'll spend my final days howling, sobbing, quivering in a corner while telling the nurses it's not fair and the doctors that they've got to invent a cure. It was a very honest article about just how much he didn't want his life to end. And yet as we come to, 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 to Mark's Gospel, Mark's Gospel shows us that, that, that Jesus... Well, he went to death. We, we saw that the last couple of weeks. But he went to death to defeat it. So as we come uh, to, to the passage, we pick up, don't we, where, where we left off. We see in, in verse, um, uh, verse 39, Jesus breathes his last. And we have that centurion, that hardened Roman centurion, who sees that Jesus' death is not like any other death he has ever seen. He just did a job that none of us could bear to do, which was crucify people. And yet Jesus, for, for Jesus' death was not a defeat. Jesus gave up his life. And something about that moment, well, he was clearly revealed to him by the Lord, wasn't it? Made the centurion recognise that Jesus was not like any other human being. That he actually is, well, he's the son of God. And Mark has written his gospel to prove that to us. And then as we move into the section, well, the next paragraph really leading up to the end of chapter 15, well, it, it, it feels like it's written in a minor key, doesn't it? 
you've got all the preparations for burial. Now, it requires a bit of speed at this point. Um, that the following day is the, is the Jewish Sabbath. And so Jews, they, they kind of work during that time. So if Jesus is going to be taken off the cross, if Jesus is, is going to be, his body is going to be treated with dignity, it's got to happen pretty quickly. So that's why we're told, verse 42, when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, Joseph then uh, goes uh, to deal with the body. Now, if you look at these verses about Jesus' burial, we think, well, you know, if we know the story, we kind of want to rush ahead, don't we? Why, why is it that Mark spends a lot of time telling us that the Lord wants us to get, get clear that Jesus buried? But there's two big points here. Mark is underlining to us that Jesus actually died. He actually died. He doesn't want us to, to, to ignore that. He doesn't want us to fall for any kind of story that Jesus somehow swooned. That he, he kind of got, became unconscious but didn't actually die. So look down at verse 44, verse 45. Just hear the word that is repeated. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. Summoning us to join, he asked him whether he was already dead. When he learned from the Sejoin, he was dead. He granted a corpse to Joseph. Mark is underlining that yes, there was no life in Jesus' body. Now there are understandable questions uh, about it. Crucifixion was a horrible way of killing someone and would have taken a long time, not the three hours that Jesus was on the cross. So, so Pilate asked the question, that if we know anything about crucifixion, we would have asked. And yet, this centurion, who, remember, knows his stuff when it comes to this brutal execution, is confirms, confirms the issue. And then Mark confirms that Jesus was actually buried. Now, you've got one of the great heroes uh, of the gospel here in Joseph of Arimathea. Now, uh, so far in the gospel, the, the, the kind of rich men uh, and the members of the San, Sanhedrin, uh, they, were, they were the people who, who wanted Jesus to die. But, but there were kind of a sh small number of individuals who quietly and secretly had heard what Jesus said and believed it. And Joseph of Arimathea was one of those men, a respected member of the council, so one of the Sanhedrin. What was he? He was himself looking for the kingdom of God. And he took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. I think it's kind of Mark's sign of saying, actually, Joseph, he, he, he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come and, and perhaps he, he actually believed it had come in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he acted with great courage at this point. But for, for Joseph to kind of step out and to step before Pilate, he, he was saying, he was suggesting he's not like the other members of the Sanhedrin. And that he was different and he was willing to treat Jesus' body with respect. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know that Pilate, didn't know if Pilate would just, uh, uh, yeah, well, Pilate had a horrendous reputation. He didn't know what would happen to him. And yet, Pilate, well, Pilate granted Jesus' body to this man. He gave his tomb. He was a rich man. He had a, he had a tomb. It was brand new. And it was given for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that tomb, well, it was witnessed. It was witnessed by the women. Uh, so you see that in verse 47. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Don't miss that. Those women, they saw Jesus die on the cross. They saw where he was buried. They are witnesses of Jesus' death and burial. All the way through, Mark is underlining, look, there are witnesses, there are people here who see and recognise that Jesus actually died. It was checked. This was not a rush job. There are no conspiracy theories that you can begin to con con concoct that explain away what happened on the cross. But Mark's saying a little bit more, I think. Under the surface of this paragraph, Mark, as a writer, he's, he's, he's almost bristling with excitement. Given 
what he's communicating. He's saying Jesus is the Christ, he is the Son of God. Given all that he said about the crucifixion and death of Jesus, the way that he subtly pointed us back to Isaiah 53, and Psalm 22, great prophecies of the fact that the Jesus as, as the Christ is the suffering servant who will die. He, he's almost kind of, you can imagine him writing and kind of smiling and thinking, well, I know something that they don't know. And if as readers we've got to this point at Mark's Gospel and we've really understood everything that's been communicated to us, we are to think, well, we know something that these characters don't know. Jesus really died as a kind of victory defeating death. Jesus really died bearing the wrath of God for his people's sin. Then his death cannot be the end. Apparently, I'm no expert, but I was reading this week. There, there's some, some of the some of the things about the original language, which kind of draw our attention to that. The way he talks about a corpse, he continues to talk about a corpse as a, as a he rather than a, an it, perhaps signalling that that he knows Jesus is not uh, Jesus will come back to life. And then, as you move into chapter 16, well, we get the scene again that a uh, mark says, let's hurry on, let's hurry on to the, to, to the next scene. And so the Sabbath passes and you get, don't you, these same women, Mary, Magdalene and Salome, they come with their spices to anoint the body, to look after, to carefully kind of anoint and, uh, and embalm the body, was what they would do to any corpse. Uh, and yet, and yet, these women, they are too late, aren't they? They are too late to do that. Now we know as readers that they are too late. Mark has already signaled that to us. Do you remember at the start uh, of this particular series in Mark, Mark's Gospel? We, we met Jesus, didn't we, in, in, in Bethany. And the, the, this woman, uh, uh, she, she, she poured that flask of ointment on her. And Jesus had said, that woman anointed Jesus' body for burial. That was where her anointing happened. But these women, as, as they rushed to the tomb, well, they were full of confusion. They didn't quite know what to do. They were thinking, well, who's going to roll away the, 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 the stone? And yet as they came, the stone had been rolled back. The tomb was already open. And they got the shock of their lives. They see this young man dressed in a white robe. They were alarmed. An angel, a messenger for God. And what is his message? Look at verse 6. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. You see, this is Mark's message in a, in a nutshell in this passage. He was crucified, absolutely, definitely died. But now he has risen. It was a surprise to them. But if we've been paying attention, it should not be a surprise to us. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is the one who defeated death by dying. Psalm 22, which Mark has alluded to in the crucifixion account, Isaiah 53, that, that great suffering servant passage, all of those passages in the Bible, in the Old Testament, which speak of what Christ is going to do through his death, always end on a high note. That death is not the end, but Jesus is the victor. What does that say to us this morning? Well, it says what we've been singing, and it says what we've already been saying, that as Jesus died and rose again, death is defeated. Death is defeated in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's heartbreaking in a way reading that uh, newspaper article from Jeremy Clarkson, kind of very honestly putting into words just a, a kind of fear, a fear of death and a kind of disappointment and sadness that life isn't what it was when he was 30, 40, 50 years younger. And deep down, I, I think we probably all recognize something of, uh, of that. But yet, there, there, is no, there is no way of curing 
and defeating death left to ourselves. We, we try and do it. We try and do it through medical science and through healthcare. We, we try and do it through personal health and fitness, which are a very good thing and a way of looking after our own bodies. But we can't hold it back. It doesn't need to, can't be held back. It, it can only be defeated. And it is only defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. I began the service by reading from the start of 1 Corinthians 15, which is a glorious passage about uh, Jesus and his death uh, and his uh, resurrection. And it's, it promises that actually if Jesus Christ is raised, then all those who belong to him will be raised. And you see, as we, we look at this passage in Mark's Gospel, we are not just looking at a historical passage which is unconnected to our lives. You see, this, this event is what we, we place all our trust in if we recognise, if we come and recognise that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. If we belong, if we turn and trust Christ, then if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, if he has come through death, then we will too. As I was saying in that children's talk, that silly little illustration about the cat's head going through, uh, going through uh, a, a hole. So the end of 1 Corinthians 15 says this, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the, the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. This perishable body must put on the imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that's written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why, why do we die? We weren't meant to die. This world wasn't created with, with death. This death came in as a result of sin, as a result of our rebellion, against God, that bears a price and a penalty. And so we die and we face God in judgment. And yet what does the Lord Jesus Christ done? He has borne that judgment, he has borne that penalty on himself in his death and has been raised to new life. And so if we belong to Christ, well, we still, we still die, but we don't die as a penalty for our sin, and when Christ returns, we will. We will be raised, and we will have new bodies, and we will have to have to face that judgment. How is that? That's good news for you if you're a Christian here this morning. But we don't have to face death with the same fear, kicking and screaming against it like that Jeremy Clarkson article. It's good news for us if we are grieving, grieving those we love who have died in the Lord. Now that doesn't mean to say that death does not sting right now. It, it, it does. There is the, the sting of pain and, and, and the sting of loss. That cry, oh death, where, where is your sting? That, that is the cry that we will cry out at the end when Christ returns, when we will be raised for death. That there, is, there is still the sting now. But that sting, well, it's more like the kind of sting of a stinging nettle, which is incredibly painful if you've ever been stung by a stinging, stinging nettle. It hurts. But, but it's not the sting of a stingray. It's not the sting of a, of a deadly scorpion, which completely destroys. No, that sting has been taken by Christ on the cross. We, we grieve but we grieve as people with hope. Jesus Christ has conquered death, and Mark's Gospel, in every way, is saying it is a reality. It's a historical reality 
then death is defeated for all who belong to him. He came out of the tomb, and so if we belong to him, we will rise. And if you're here this morning still, don't know if that is true of you, still in full of fear of your own death, I, I would say come to Jesus. He is the only answer. He is the only answer to death. And just notice that it's striking in, the, in these passages that he has drawn our attention to two individuals who recognise actually who Jesus is. The, the, the Roman centurion and Joseph of Arimathea, uh, that uh, member of the Sanhedrin, complete opposites, Jew and a Gentile, and, and saying, well, Jesus, Jesus is there for all kinds of people, so come to him, whoever you are. Jesus is the Christ who has defeated death. And then secondly, just as we close, there's a second point. And he's not just defeated death, but he's also forgiven our sin. He has forgiven the sin of his people. And we should, so we shouldn't race over the, the, the second statement that the angels say to the women who come to the tomb. Go, verse 7, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Such a precious statement, isn't it? What are the women to do? They are to go and tell Jesus' disciples. They are particularly to tell Peter that he has risen from the dead. Now, if you've been here over the last few weeks as we've been looking at the passage leading up to the death and crucifixion of Jesus, one of the themes, sadly, has been that just how terrible the disciples have been. They wanted to follow Jesus. They've had that hope to follow Jesus. They said, well, we'll go with you wherever you go. And yet they have failed again and again. Not just Peter. They, they all said it. Uh, they all said that I will not I will die, deny you. But, but where are they at this point? They're in hiding. It was even more acute for Peter, wasn't it? Now, he followed Jesus a lot closer than any of the others. He got to that court the courtroom of the high priest, and yet three times denied categorically and explicitly that he never knew Jesus. And they've all run away. Sad, isn't it? It's tragic. Now, humanly speaking, what would we expect? If, if that had been the case, uh, to a, 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 and, and that Jesus had then come back, and if Jesus was a kind of ordinary human being, what would we expect Jesus to say? Oh, well, I've just got to Start up, start up again. Use a different and a better bunch of people who are just not going to turn their back at the first sign of hardship. That's not what he says at all, is it? He says, go, tell his disciples. Go and tell Peter. He, he's, he's, he's going before you. Go to Galilee. He's got work for you to do. He's forgiven you. He's going to make you new. And what does that say? That says that, that Jesus' death, it, it was for sinners. That's all it was for. It wasn't for people who think they're good. It wasn't for people who thought they were strong. No, it was for people who mess up. People who turn their back on God. People who think they are strong but actually turn out to be weak. And the disciples and Peter show that categorically, don't they? For people who do not obey Jesus' words, who do not do what they say they will do. And Jesus wants to reassure these disciples, Peter and disciples, that, that actually they've not just been given a second chance. No, that because of his death, he, he has died for them. He has taken their sin. He has taken their rebellion. They are forgiven. There's a brand new start. And they are welcomed into Jesus' life. And welcomed into his mission. And actually, if they're going to do anything for Jesus, they need a completely new life. And they need his power. And we see that as we turn the page into what happens next as the church is established. That is a glorious message. That's a glorious message for us this morning. This is what Jesus does for, for all who come to him. Whoever we are, he, he says, actually, we want to, we, we read through Mark and we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Well, don't stay away if you're aware of your sin. Don't stay away if you are aware of your weakness, whoever you are. If you're the religious person who actually uses your religion to keep Jesus at a distance. 
when you can turn from that and turn back to Christ. If you're a person who lived all your life up to this point wanting nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you think, well, this might be true, but, but how would Jesus ever want, to, want anything to do with me? Jesus says, no, come. Tell, it's as if he's saying in verse 7, tell, tell them that I've been raised to life, I've died, and if they trust me, my life can be theirs. If you're someone who's aware of your own failures and sins acutely, it's as if Jesus is saying, go, go tell you that Jesus has died and he's risen. And he's gone ahead of you. So turn and go to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why personally I like verse 8 as the ending of Mark. So realistic, isn't it? What, what do the women do? They, they go out, fled from the tomb, trembling, and with astonishment that sees them, and they, they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Where are we at the end of uh, uh, verse 8 of, of Mark 16? Well, Jesus, in a sense, he, he is both absent and he is present. He has defeated death, but, but we don't see him with our own eyes. We have to we hear the words and, and we're called, are, are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the words? Are we going to believe the messenger from God? And that is the same situation all of us are in this morning. Are we going to believe the messenger? The Lord Jesus has died and has risen and he forgives the sin even of those who most clearly and obviously betray him. Well, are we going to believe that message? Are we going to go to him? Are we going to believe that he has gone ahead of, of us and he is calling us to follow him? Isn't that, in a sense, the message we all need to hear this morning or this Easter morning? And are we going to rejoice in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Christ? He is the Son of God. He has defeated death and he forgives sin. Let's pray. Lord oh God and Heavenly Father, we rejoice. We rejoice that Jesus is alive. We rejoice the fact he's defeated death. We rejoice the fact that there is forgiveness in him for, for every sin. If we return to him, if we belong to him. And we pray that this morning we may all have that trust and that hope in Christ. Pray that none of us will, will stay away from him and that we will know what it means to follow and to belong to him, to be united to him. And so live in the confidence that comes from forgiveness and for knowing that death is defeated. Amen. Before we come to the communion table, let's uh, stand uh, and sing rejoicing in the fact that Jesus is raised. Find me the glory. <laughs>
media now. It's helpful if we sit in alternate rows, it's just helpful for the server. tells us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So let's confess our sins as we come to take communion. Lord Jesus, I have sinned times without number, and have been guilty of pride and unbelief, and on neglect to seek you in my daily life. My sins and shortcomings led to me with a list of accusations. But I thank you that they will not stand against me, for all have been laid on Christ. Deliver me from every evil habit, every interest of former sins, everything that dims the brightness of your grace in me, everything that prevents me taking delight in you. Amen. God in his word then goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I will say this is the Lord's table. It's not the table of the church. It's not my table. It is the Lord's table. Jesus died. He rose again. He has ascended on high. He says, come and he says to you, if you know him, if you know Jesus, the Saviour and Lord, if you turn to him in repentance and faith, uh, he says, come, eat and drink. And if not you this morning, if you've never turned to Jesus, if you're not living a life of repentance and faith, then please stay, back, stay away, just, just let the bread, just let the cup uh, pass you by, but I would urge you to, to think over and perhaps even cry out to the Lord this morning. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He has defeated death. He forgives the sin of all who come to him. I would plead with you to, to spend time uh, thinking over all you have heard and to go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Give our son to give thanks for the bread of the cup. Before we take the bread and the cup, I wanted to ask you a question this morning, this Easter morning. <clears throat> what would you do, what would you say to me if next time you came and saw me, you saw me walking as you do? There was no hint of my cerebral palsy. I, I didn't fall, off, fall down every few steps or my balance was great. I was able to serve communion without spilling a drop, what would you say? What would you do? Wouldn't you be amazed? Wouldn't you say to me, son, what has happened to you? How did you get healed? Tell me more about it. 
I will tell you what I would do. I'd be jumping up and down, down the street, screaming, I am well, I am healed. I want to have a party. Let's eat. More than my legs being healed. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to say to you, you are a recipient of a great miracle. More than my legs being healed, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, you are the recipient of a great, historical, undeniable miracle. The miracle of someone who is an enemy of God being allowed to be a friend of God. Someone who is an enemy of God being denied the favors of God being welcomed to God's table. That is what we celebrate this morning. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, our communion, we celebrate the miracle of redemption, of death being defeated. What we know by faith, Pam, now knows by sight. Isn't that wonderful? Sure we grieve. And our love goes to the Harrisons this morning as a church family. But it is a reality of that miracle that we celebrate this morning, that death is defeated. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, Thank you that this Easter morning, because of your great work at the cross, we can celebrate and remember that miracle of you defeating death once and for all. Yes, we grieve the loss of those we love, and yes, it hurts. But we know that death is not the end. Because you have defeated death. Lord, so as we remember that, let us partake of this bread and this wine with thanks. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, the Lord and Savior who has defeated death once and for all. Amen. Back in Mark's Gospel, uh, just before Jesus' death, he instituted what we are doing now, had his disciples around him. And Jesus said, as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing, he broke it. He gave it to the same, them and said, take, this is my body. He took a cup, when he gave it thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Do hold on to the bread. We will eat together. Um, it is uh, communion. We are eating it together as God's people. So look around you, recognize one another as well as the sisters in the Lord.
sweet together. So with a cup, we will drink together. drink together. One closing hymn is a hymn rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord who's achieved and where he is now the head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now.
and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.